Hello, and welcome to We Endure. Um, thanks to the IBMA for uh, getting this together for us, putting it on and, and getting us live. Um, today, we have Marianne, Kelsey, and Al, and we're going to be discussing um, some of just the vulnerabilities and, and issues that are going on right now today in the music industry with this worldwide pandemic that we are facing. So to introduce myself, my name is Danielle Boker, and I work for the nonprofit arm of the Recording Academy called Music Cares. We provide emergency financial assistance to people in the music industry and um, have been very busy lately. And we, I also have a part-time private practice as a therapist um, in the Nashville area, working specifically with people in the music industry. Um, Marianne, tell us a little bit about you and your background for those of those of us who might not know you. Uh, my name is Marianne. A lot of people call me Aunt Mama. I am. I've, I've had the privilege of a, a lot of careers and inventions and identities, but I was thinking on this south side of, of life, I would primarily be a storyteller. Careers and, and inventions and identities, but I was thinking on this teach south side of life, I would. Use Primarily be a storyteller, career, inventions, and identity. I was thinking I was a sound side of this life. I was primarily be a storyteller, career, inventions, and identity. I was thinking I was a sound side of this life. I was primarily be a storyteller, career, inventions, and identity. I was thinking I was a sound side of this life. I was primarily be a storyteller. Well, we're definitely going to want to get into that, and I, and we want to hear more too about your background working with um, the National Association of Mental Illness. You've done some work with them, right? I have I have uh, told stories with NAMI well, and worked with them, and still continue that. to work with NAMI and a, uh, a number of people who were working in mental health issues. I finally came out of the uh, the closet some years ago and told a story at Folk Alliance about. A little problem I had had growing up with audio hallucinations, and it was something I had not ever told about, did tell about, and boom, all of a sudden, every musician and I were having this conversation. So it seems that a story that I was never going to tell seems to be a story I can't quit telling. And one of the things that I don't, I don't, I don't like this period of time. I don't like the racial unrest. I don't like, although it's moving things forward, the contradictions get clearer and clearer. But the one thing I do notice is that we can use the word mental health. More people use the word mental health in public without as much criticism and shame that we grew up with, or some of us grew up with. It may be different, Kelsey, for you. You're uh, in, a, in a younger age group, but if that comes out of this, that would be a good thing to keep, since yep. we all have those feelings or have feelings. Hey. Right, that There's openness. Yeah, I don't, I'm excited I don't know to hear what say about. Yeah, that openness to, um, you know, mental health and, and that mental health is something and self-care is something that we all have in our yeah, lives. It's, it's not life. just, you know, if you have an extreme diagnosis that you deal with mental health issues, stress is dealing with mental health issues and everyone deals with stress. So Kelsey, tell us a little bit about you and um, kind of your background. Um. Yeah, so I um, I started out in music when I I didn't start playing an instrument until I was thirteen. Um, I grew up um, in a Christian home. My dad's been a pastor my whole life, and so when we, my brother and sister and I got a little bit older, um, we just wanted to have something that we all did together. Um, and so my dad actually just picked out, my dad has always been a fan of country and bluegrass music. Um, he grew up on Merle Haggard and George Jones and all that. So we, um, he picked out some instruments for us and said, Hey, if you guys enjoy this, then, you know, we'll go from there. We'll pay for lessons. We'll do, you know, we can have some fun with this. I'm not going to make you do it. Uh, let's try it out for a year. And if you like it, I'm going to push you to do it. 
So make it, you know, kind of make up your mind. And if you like it, we're go we're doing it, but we're not going to have to do it. So um, we started taking lessons. I only took lessons for about a year, um, actually, from a fiddle player. And so then after that, we started playing together as a family band. My dad traveled and preached a lot, and so we would go and play in the churches where he would preach. Um, and so from there, um, we got really busy being in churches um, just about every week, especially in the summer. And so my dad just got to the point where his his um, priority as far as a job wise, you know, separate from family was to be at church. And he was a pastor, not someone who was necessarily an evangelist. So he said that it was time for him to step back and stay at church more and if we wanted to continue with that then we could and that's when we decided to um go to our first like big bluegrass festival there was only two that we could drive to in florida i'll go and you know a day trip you know somewhere um so we went to spigma in nashville that was in 2011 um so i was 21 um, no, that would, it, it must have been 2000 then, because um, I wasn't 21 yet. But anyways, so we played that bank contest at Spigma because we found out that it was cheaper to get into Spigma if we entered the bank contest. <laughs> so, and, you know, we were teenagers or barely college age at the time and didn't have a lot of money. So there were six of us and we were like, okay, well, we'll just practice some songs and play the competition. And we got third place. And wow. then the next year went back again and got first. And we were like, well, maybe we like this. Like, this is kind of fun. And um, thought that it would be fun to make some extra money or any, uh, maybe tens of dollars playing that. And so from there, um, we ended up going full time playing music, and um, so that's where that all started. But I, I had, um, I myself have suffered with a lot of anxiety issues that, from all the way from when I was a kid. That when I was a kid and a teenager, I just didn't know that that's what it was. Um, like Marianne had mentioned, it wasn't talked about even when I was a kid, and I think. I probably remember that because I was dealing with something that I didn't know what was going on. Um, and I didn't find out until a handful of years ago that a close family member of mine dealt with the same thing, that they were just always told not to talk about it. And that if they had anxiety problems, then they didn't have enough faith in God. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the case. Um, mm -hmm. Not even close. So, um, they, you know, we, my dad was, um, not okay with, you know, those type of circles, um, and any kind of religion or faith or music or whatever, there are different circles of people that just naturally fit together. They end up together. So we kind of got out of that circle and, <laughs> and I got married in 2012 um, and about a year and a half after that, I had a major panic attack in the Ryman. We had gone to the Ryman to see Merle Haggard play. And while I was sitting there, I felt like the walls were closing in on me. I felt like very hot and nauseous and didn't know what was going on, but I was having a panic attack and had to leave. I saw him play like one song and then I stood outside the rest of the night. And from then on for two or three years, I, I dealt with it pretty intensely. Um, I couldn't be by myself very often um, because the anxiety was just too bad. I was afraid to be by myself. I was afraid, um, for me, it was an illness. I was afraid of getting sick um, or catching things from other people, which a low coronavirus. Um, but um, I, so I dealt with that for quite a few years playing shows coming on and off stage and it was just anxiety was just in, intense um i went for a very long period of time possibly close to a year where i did not sing lead on a song on stage because i didn't think i could get through it um 
so it took a lot of um, a lot of doing. I finally I talked to my dad and told him what was going on after keeping it to myself for over a year mm-hmm. before I got help, and just told him I couldn't do this anymore. Like I don't know, you know. I said I've prayed, I've asked God to take this away from me, and He hasn't. Um, and He finally said something to me that I should have already known. But a lot of times when you're hurting, you just don't. You don't remember things. You don't think of things. You're not on the right train of thought. Um, but God never told us that he would take away our pain and our burdens. He just told us that he would give us the strength to get through it. Um, and that was 100% correct. So I, my anxiety is not gone. Um, I got a lot of help with it from a psychiatrist, psychologist. Thanks, Al. Um And from a lot of my own reading, my faith was definitely a huge part of that. But uh, my dad has always said that um, you pray for your crops at the end of a hoe handle. So you have to help yourself before God's going to help you. And um, that was a huge help to me. So my dad was very instrumental in that. And also a doctor that um, I got a lot of help from and was not okay with having to have a doctor help me. Because I thought that that meant that something was really wrong with me, and something was wrong, but that was okay. Right. I just wasn't okay with it at the time. That's so a big. Key. That's where I'm at now. Yeah, and so yeah. um, yeah, we're off the road right now. My husband um is actually um plays with Josh Turner, but I stay at home now with our two kids and just in a different season of life. But that's my backstory and kind of where we're at. So. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you so much for your openness and vulnerability. That just piggybacks on what Marianne was saying. With more you open up about what you've struggled with, other people find that they can open up as well. And that, you know, we find that we're surrounded by people who are experiencing very similar things and we can be great supports for each other. Al, tell us a little bit about you and, and your background. Sure. Um, I like to say that I'm a frustrated novelist because <laughs> I've always wanted to write a novel or the perfect short story. I really want to be Flannery O'Connor when I grow up, but um, but instead of being a novelist, I ended up being a counselor uh, because but it's just the way to find my way into the stories of others. And so I always get to be a part of a story. In my own story, I have a background of uh, severe depression. And having come through that in my 30s, um, I ended up benefiting so much from counseling that I had avoided because our family was a happy family and we didn't do pain. Um, I ended up going to school and counseling did private practice for a long time, moved to Nashville, started a private practice in 97. And after about the first year, I noticed as I looked over my list of clientele, I'd finally built it up, it was like 90% music related. And either all musicians are crazy, which is probably true, or um, what what is more true is that probably the first person that came to see me was in the industry and there's just this amazing network especially in Nashville everybody knows everybody and so little by little they would tell a friend they would tell a friend and I grew this counseling practice and then I started noticing that um, I had kind of a ministry background with college students and in the church um, for a while and but I started noticing that touring artists um, there was something unique about them, and one of it was uh, they couldn't come regularly. You know, when I went to counseling by myself or with my wife, I went you know every Tuesday at eleven. Well, I've never met an artist that could come every Tuesday at eleven. <laughs> you know, that just doesn't happen. But I also realized that people were struggling to pay the going rates. Um, who could, I can't even afford that especially a, a new artist paying now now the rates are anywhere from 150 to 200 an hour I think but um, but I noticed they couldn't come regularly they um, 
couldn't afford me often, but but even more so, there were some uniquenesses about their life. Um, there was a struggle with too much fame or not enough fame. Uh, struggle with too much money or not enough money. Struggle with um, who people fantasized them to be as they were fans looking at them on stage and who they knew they were and the distance between those two and trying to decide whatever. Um, <clears throat> but I also, anyway, I, I just felt like there was something that I was not giving them as a therapist. They, it just wasn't working, both the timing and whatever. And so I came up with this little entrepreneurial idea that I'd go to five labels and just ask them to buy a day of my counseling practice and I'd see their, their people for free. And we could hang out as long as we need to hang out and that might be a better solution. So the first person I went to was uh, EMI Christian Label because they seemed to get it. And uh, they actually said, yeah, we'll do it. We'll buy Wednesdays. And went, okay. And they did, and they sent their artists, um, kind of Peter York, the president of it, they sent their artist and they said our only our only deal is that you have to see any artist from any label, not just ours, which is unheard of. So after three months they came back and said, Would you be willing to start a nonprofit? Something good is happening with our artists, they have a place to go. And um, that's not their management and not their label, and uh, it's safe and it's confident. And would you start a nonprofit and we'll help uh, shake the trees in the industry to fund it? And that was in 2001. And since then, um, our place is called Porter's Call. Uh, Porter was a person in the fifth century monastery who was the guy who welcomed sojourners and helped them find the way to what they needed. When they knocked on the door, he'd call out, thanks be to God, and come on in. And then if they needed a bed, he'd give them a bed. If they needed a food, he'd feed them. If they needed wise counsel, he'd counsel them. So we don't call ourselves therapists. We call ourselves porters. And when an artist knocks on the door, we help them find the way to what they need. So our job is basically porters call is a place where artists come for counsel, support, and encouragement. A uh, place to get off stage and deal with the issues they face, uh, exacerbated by the touring life. And um, there is no cost to our services. Um, so I basically, if I were to, Marianne, you just kind of spoke my language. I, I, I think what I really do is try to help a person understand their story and maybe where that story went off for a while and try to help them find the way to the path and to creating some new chapters and new stories. And it's just a blast. Um, and to your point earlier, when I first started this, uh, people would almost come to my office with bags over their heads because it was a shameful thing to go get help. And now, um, 2,000 artists later, um, People are kind of uh, standing up on stage going, hey, I go to Porter's Call. If you're an artist, you ought to go too. So I've, I've noticed that change. And like you said, if mental health now is spoken of as something we all need to work on and get better and get some help, it just thrills me that it, it is becoming one of those things that people are going, you know, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to go to a nutritionist, and I'm going to go to a counselor, or in that case, a porter. So I'm glad that's happened. Yeah, absolutely. And you really, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, Al, that especially I feel like musicians and the touring music community, there are some really particular nuances in yeah. this world that many folks do. And I, I pulled a couple of stats. There really aren't that many. There are not very many stats. Not a, There's not a whole lot of research about mental health in the music industry. But a couple things. Um, Record Union in 2019, one of the things that they found with their research was more than seven out of 10 independent musicians have battled stress, anxiety, and depression. Oh, yeah. 10. And then Mira 
Um, the Music Industry Research Association in 2018 put out a study and they found that 50% of mu musicians reported battling symptoms of depression. That's greater than 25% of the general population. So we know that stress, anxiety, depression are already things that those in our music industry struggle with anyway, that, that tend to be more, um, more exacerbated within this industry. But now you bring in a worldwide pandemic that has essentially shut down the majority of our industry. What have you guys seen as, you know, through colleagues, friends, clients, whatever it be, yourselves, what have you seen um, happening within the music industry and, and how has that affected that already, um, that already kind of tender spot for those within our industry? Can I tell a little story? Yes, Marianne, please. Of course you can. Um, my story with this happening is losing gigs just like everybody else and becoming aware of all the people around me because I'm a storyteller with musicians and aware that everybody's got all these gigs and there's a couple in Seattle named Ben and Amber Ben is a ma magical guitar player and travel and very privileged to be able to make his living as a guitar player but he wanted to he wanted to mate and he met amber and it was everything just fit together amber's a, a middle school drama teacher and was so busy with uh, her her classes and her kids and the stage moms that it was great that ben was gone on tour and then they'd have these great coming togethers and it just fit until covid came and all of Ben's work was gone. And Amber had to learn new technology. She had to learn how to take the dining room table and turn it into a classroom and how to teach the kids who didn't want to be there and wanted to be on their telephones instead of learning and deal with their mothers and fathers. And then how does she take her clown pass and put red noses on everybody and all the little boxes all the kids are laughing and she's got that going and Ben walks by and he sees all the clown noses and he's not laughing he is going out in the yard because he's taken up a job of walking the perimeter and checking the fence and listening to his phone because every time it sort of goes off there's a signal that says he should be getting on an airplane to go mm -hmm. play a gig or what time he should report and so he walks, he tries to play, it, it doesn't feel right, doesn't feel good, he's gaining weight, he's trying to be useful, but he doesn't feel useful, and he feels lesser than, because some, some musicians just got right out there, and they got on Instagram, and, and, and big musicians, Abigail and Baylor, are, are playing banjos with kids calling all over them in, in the living room, and, Ben doesn't want to be in the living room. He wants to be with his bandmates. He wants to be sweaty. He wants to be collaborating. And he wants to be in a cozy and intimate club, which are words that, don't those words sound dangerous now? Cozy? Yeah. yeah. Can't, can't do it. He wants the dining room table back too. And Amber wants him to try to meditate. And he yells back at her and says, don't yoga me. Don't yoga me. He goes out to the backyard to keep to keep working. And while he's there, he's also trying to figure out his place in this. What's he doing? We have we have Black Lives Matter. We have a country that's divided. What is he doing? He's feeling sorry for himself. Now he's feeling sorry that he's feeling sorry for himself. He's agitated, just, just like uh, you were talking about. Anxiety, just riddled with anxiety. He wants to do something. He doesn't feel like he can do something. And, and just very recently, some of his musical friends got in touch with him. And one of them had written a song, and they had an idea how they work, could work together. And there's a technology, a team share app. You can actually put your hands on somebody else's computer, or it looks like it is, and help get through that. So they were working with Ben on the technology, and he started trying to trying to get a guitar riff kind of kind of written. And, and he's catching a few good runs. He's, he's 
He's, it's tense. It's just like we're having a latency issue and you freeze and it would have to do that. And the, the tension inside the house with all these kids trying to learn and Amber's tense and he's tense, but he's trying to figure this out. And he's never been tense. Life has been a bowl of cherries for Ben and all of a sudden all these feelings are new and he doesn't know what to do with them. Well, a friend of ours who runs Winter Blue Studio in Seattle posted some pictures. She's, she's, she's doing some recording. And ben saw them, all these pictures of a, of a band that's mostly black. There's some brown players too. And they're all in their red outfits. They're all gussied up. They're getting ready for their Christmas show. They're recording their holiday show. And Ben realized he needed to do something for somebody else. He'd been so concentrated on himself. So he goes into the house and he tells Amber that we need a little Christmas. We need a little Christmas right now. And just like Auntie Mame, they get out some decorations. They got some Christmas lights going over the dining room wall. And ben starts to play Joy to the World. And he feels like a mu musician again. He's a guitar player again. And that felt good. Mm. And I think that losing and closings are brutal. They're just brutal on all of us. And when we lose our work and we lose our love, we don't know who we are. We don't know what our stakes are in the ground. So, and they, they interplay. They, they work together. And if we can help our friends, call all the work you're doing in Porter's Call, raising children. If we can make those phone calls to each other, if we can. I get goosed. I don't like all this new stuff. I do not want to be an audio engineer. I'm not a good audio engineer. So I was, you know, walking around and somebody in the Go Jane's group here said, you know, when well, you talk to yourself all the talk to your plants, why don't you record? And I went, I don't want people to know I'm out there talking to my plants. That doesn't seem proper. Um, but she was right. And then somebody else had an idea. Well, it was actually an idea I had. And then they gave the idea back to me and now we're seeing what we can make with it. And inch by inch, I think we help each other get in touch with ourselves so we know who we are. We can hold on to who we are. And that may mean we become something else. It may be transformative in there. It probably will be transformative because I have all these cords and cables and microphones and I don't know what to do with them, but by George and golly, I will figure that out. I will go back on radio. I will tell stories again. Tell your stories too if I can. Anybody, if anybody's listening has got a story, I want their story. I want to tell those stories. We'll put them on radio. So I think the identity piece is really important. I think the, I think that we have to help. Think of other things for other people to do and we do have to get outside ourselves. We stay inside ourselves too long. And then whatever faith you have, whatever, whether it's a Christian faith or a Baha'i faith or Jewish faith, what, whatever holiday you got coming, maybe we can all plan for the holiday. Maybe it's time to have Christmas in July. I love that, Marianne. How, Kelsey, tell us, how have you been keeping your head above water? What are some things that you've been doing? Well, um, I have to be honest, a toddler and a newborn keep your mind very busy. Um, so I honestly, like I, I told you guys when we were, you know, kind of getting to know each other before we started here, um, it's, it was not easy for me going from one to two kids, but I'm also thankful that it happened when it did because it has kept my mind preoccupied so much um so two kids that's one way um <laughs> but other than that you know my faith is is I was gonna say a huge part of who I am but it's everything that I am and it was very hard for me not getting up and going to church every Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night 
um, that was just a huge shock for my system. Um, like I said, my, my dad has been a pastor my entire life. I was in church since I was, you know, two or three weeks old. Um, so that's, you know, that's a huge, a huge thing for me. So it, for me with my anxiety personality, um, I learned that my biggest issue is what ifing everything. Um, I would always say, well, what if I do this and then I get sick? Or what if I go here and I don't feel well enough to do it? Or what if, what if, what if? Um, and so I would constantly find myself and still find myself thinking, what if it never goes back? What if it's never back to our normal? What if this is how it's going to be forever? Um and I don't, I don't really have a great answer for that, except for what if? I mean, so, so what do we do? Um, what I do is keep trusting God, and I keep raising my kids, and I keep... I mean, my number one job right now is to be a mom, so I have to be a mom whether there's COVID or whether there's people riding in the streets or whether there isn't. And so I have to do today and take care of today. Um, and sometimes that's all you can do with anxiety or depression or just daily stress is get through today, do what you know you can do today or within the next hour and then move on from there. Um, and I think that that has helped me a lot. Just not trying, trying not to get ahead of myself and, um, is a huge, a huge help for me because even if I did know what if was going to happen, happened, I wouldn't be able to change it. I wouldn't be able to fix it. Um, I am naturally a, a fixer. I want to, I'm a people pleaser. I want everybody to be happy. I want everybody to be happy with me and approve of what I do. Um, and you know, that lessens a little bit as you get older, but I think for my personality type, it's always, it always lingers just a little bit. Um, so I just have to kind of, you know, keep myself in check every day and remember that God is not surprised by what's going on right now. Um, he's not wringing his hands wondering, oh my, what am I going to do if, you know, COVID is still around in six months or a year or five years or whatever. Um so I just have to trust that God knows what's best for me and, and he has it under control and he's taken care of me so far. And, um, that's, that's what I hold on to every day. And so it really helped you to live one day at a time and to have your faith. And that's something that you've, you've always had as something that has been a support for you. And then also realizing we don't have control. We don't have control over this circumstance, but what we do have control over is the way that we react to it. And that really can change in such a big way, can change how things look moving forward. Al, tell us what you would think. I, I know that there are a lot of people who have already had, um, they already have some skills in place. They've already had struggles with depression or anxiety, but I think that there are probably a lot of people now that we have this pandemic and there is that lack of control that maybe are experiencing those feelings for the first time and don't really know what to do. What are some just skills that you feel like would be helpful for them to have to start using now? You know, um, I have gotten a lot of those calls. If, if, we, we, if we talk about there's a generalized anxiety with most people who do art anyway, um, it's certainly been just the levels of it have just risen and we're being inundated, obviously, and we're glad with calls from people. Um, and, you know, the first thing I say to somebody who says, you know, right now I'm, um, I'm just feeling anxious and I'm feeling afraid and I'm feeling mad. And that, 
I usually say, well, I would be really worried if you weren't. Yeah. Um, because if you weren't, there'd be something wrong with you. And if you weren't, you'd be stuffing it and it's going to blow one of these days. So first of all, I really want to normalize the fact that these are anxious days. They just are and fearful days. And I was talking with one artist and we, he said, you know, if I was depressed or if I was dealing with an addiction, there's somebody to go talk to that's been depressed or that's had an addiction, but there's nobody to talk to that's been through the plague, you know? And he said, no, so nobody knows the answer to this. And I said, you know, it, it seems like um, what people feel like is they're walking through the dark woods on a moonlit night without a flashlight. And somebody has told them that somewhere in the woods, there's a hungry mountain lion, but they're not sure exactly where it is. And you're just walking along waiting for a twig to snap and if it does you just go nuts and so it's real first of all that's what i said and people have to just go on and be anxious for a while and be fearful and be mad because it's just real um but but i think there's a certain point in there where um i remember there was a time when i was depressed and if you've been around a person who's depressed for a long time uh, you, if you're close to them, you start getting a little mad at them <laughs> because, because, um, or at least people are mad at me because they're impotent to do anything about your situation. And I remember going to my counselor who said, who was one of those people <laughs> kind of weary of my long, whatever, but a very kind man. He said, Al, you know what I'd like for you to do today? Uh, what? He said, um, I think you need to wash your car because I've seen it and it's very dirty. <laughs> and I think he was saying, do something to take care of yourself and to not let it go. But then he said, um, and I want you to find somebody that needs a cup of cold water and take it to them. It might be a mom with two little kids. <laughs> um, she needs something that she can't get, you know, whether that's an amazing thing of ice cream from something or whether it's calling her, calling her up and say, what do you need? Or a friend, whatever. So give to yourself, give to somebody else. Um, so I, I try to encourage that to do something beyond the moment, because right now there's nothing I can do about COVID except for wear a mask and social distance. And, and try to be creative with whatever you're doing. And a lot of, I see a lot of amazing creative things coming out of this community. Um, but the other thing is, I think, trying to help them change the conversation a little bit that's going on in their head. I asked a good friend of mine who was in her 80s one time, I said, what do you do? What do you do when things come your way uh, that are bad? Uh, difficulty, pain, all this. What is the prayer that you pray? Or what is it, the words that you say? And she said, um, my prayer is, uh, God, what does this make possible? What does this make possible? And I really liked that because it wasn't kind of a cheer up statement, but it was kind of looking down the road and going, I think something's going to be different. Um, and I've already talked to a lot of people ask with that question, and they're they're saying they're they're telling me different things that they're noticing in their own marriage or in their friendships that are being made possible. Um, some things are not being made possible in some marriages, but some are. But but it kind of gets them out of the present discussion. The other thing that someone told me the other day, and I never know when somebody tells me the root word of this is, I never know if it's really the root word or not. But a friend of mine told me that he said, you know, this is this this time feels like apocalyptic. I'm I'm expecting the plague of the frogs to come next or something like that. But he said, um, the root word of apocalypse is the great revealing. 
And if that's true, that's just marvelous to me because um, it makes us ask the question, whether it's with COVID, whether it's with uh, race relations and conflict, is what, what is it that's being revealed right now? What is it that's being revealed in me as a person, um, as I see my own self, uh, my own fear or my own biases? Um, what is being revealed in us as a nation? Um, what is it that we see? What can we learn with what we see? So part of what I try to encourage people to do is to ask a different question. Because um, although it's important, what am I going to do is just unanswerable right now. And, and to me, to ask a question uh, to reach beyond yourself or to ask a question that makes you think and consider the future, whatever that may look like, um, just helps to have t people to have a little bit of a deep breath. Um, and then sometimes I tell people to get a stick and go out and hit a tree um, <laughs> really hard, <laughs> and that helps. And if they happen to be on a farm, cut some wood. <laughs> that always helps. So. Chop wood, carry water. Huh? Chop wood, carry water. Yeah, that's, you could save a lot of money on counseling if you just pass that word around. Right, right. <laughs> you know, the, going back to the root words, I really appreciate what you just said. There's, there's another root word, and I, I do know this is true and because I've researched because I've said it too many times. <laughs> uh, when someone finds their vocation, they find their voice because the root word of vocation comes from voice. So the entire music industry, the arts industry, where we speak or sing, we've kind of lost our voice. Mm. We've lost our vocation. Mm. And we've got a lot tied up in that. Mm -hmm. So we need to get our voice back to be in touch with our vocation. And I think that your... Uh, you're revealing, you know, that if that is revealed to us, what we're going to do with those voices. Yeah. Because no one has more opportunity than musicians to use those voices now. And I don't think God was surprised, Kelsey, but there sure were a lot of other people who were, who were surprised. Yeah. And a lot of us might have been surprised because we haven't been paying attention. Mm -hmm. So I think paying attention and figuring out how to use those voices and what has been revealed to us or in the Christian sense, what God has revealed to us. It, time, the time has come. We need our vocation. We need everybody to be in touch with their vocation. I think. I think that's an excellent point because right now people are so concerned about their jobs mm -hmm. um, that they've forgotten the word vocation. And, um, I, I love that. Uh, for me, I think whether I'm a musician or not, maturity is finding my voice. Uh, growing is finding the voice that you were born with that got covered over with all the crap of life, but it's still there. And and I, I really agree, Marianne, that I feel like with with some of the musicians I'm talking to, they, they are finding that because they're going, something was taken away from me being on stage and every yeah oh did we lose al yeah i'm not hearing him right now oh, no he's frozen and he was saying like the biggest right there, right, right there right there so well hopefully he'll be able to get back on and join us but um i've been looking at some of the discussion going on on facebook and and i feel like this kind of goes along with what we were talking about and um looking internally and people starting to look outward and what if there are people who haven't noticed themselves that they're dealing with these issues, that they're dealing with depression or anxiety, but you as a friend have noticed that. 
what can you do and what can you say to other people around you um, to help them during this time? Um, yeah, I think that, you know, obviously acknowledging that there is an issue um, is where it has to start. And, at, but after that, helping them to help themselves is going to be so crucial. I think, um, you know, just you can't expect the help and relief to come from someone else um, when you're not willing to help yourself. Mm -hmm. So if a person is not in a place to where they understand and know that they're at the end and there's nowhere else to go except find help, get some resources, you know, material that you can read and reactively read, you know, like with a pen and a highlighter and like you're, you know, there are, there is a book that I read called Anxiety, Phobias and Panic by a man, um, Purifoy was his last name. Um, I don't remember his first name, but that book changed my entire life because it showed me so much that I thought that I was the only one who felt that way, or I was the only one who had these thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, and it showed me that I wasn't. And for me, that was huge. Knowing if you're able to tell someone, you're not the only one who feels this way. Mm -hmm. You're not the only one who struggles. You're not the only one who is scared or mad, like Al was saying, or angry. Um, you're not the only one. And there are ways to help ease that. And even though it may not go away, there are ways to help navigate through it. Um, so, you know, to find a, a doctor who can help you, like I said, the book that I read that was, you know, referred to me by a doctor who I got help with, it was life-changing for me. Um, so I think I would just start there just, befriending them and saying, look, I can't tell you everything's going to be okay because that's not going to help you. Um, even though it will be okay, but that's like telling somebody who, you know, broke their leg to get up and walk it off. You know, it's, um, so letting them know I'm here when you need me, but here are the resources and the steps to help yourself. Um, I think, I think that's a, a, a good first step. Um, and then just do what you said you would do and be there when they call, be there when they're not okay. Um, the Bible says to rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Um, it's easy to be with people when they're happy and on top of the world, um, but not quite as easy to be with them when they're under the house <laughs> and in the ditch, you know? Um, so I think that's a big, a big step. Yeah. I think sometimes we don't wait for people to call. It's one of the things I particularly have learned in, in uh, with 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 artists of color, with black artists, um, we wait to be told, or we call and say, you know, how are you? Just figure out something to do, and do it. There are people who are tired of being asked, and I think that um, Kelsey, your points is so well taken in terms of uh, to sit with people to to speak with them or just listen to them. And I think that people have called me and said, what are you, what are you writing? You know, out of the blue, what are you writing? I'm not writing. Oh, what are you writing? Well, I wrote this. Oh, we'll read it. Really motivated, really helped, really helped. And there are lots of things that I think we can do to look at our own definitions. Am I defined? Is this how I, am I defined by everything outside of who I am? Aren't I still a, kind person you're you're still a, you're still a mother still a good good woman you know there's so much that defines us and i think we have to look at this point it's another part of the apocalyptic that he was talking about is to define ourselves internally and externally and work with that and externally we got you know whoever you vote for vote just vote musicians have got great audiences to remind people of that and the venues are closing. So many of our beloved venues are closing. And there's legislation in front of Congress, the Restart Act, which will, 
re Republican sponsored, across the aisle sponsored. If we can get that act passed, there will be venues that will be able to stay open maybe, maybe forever, maybe just longer. But there's some real specific things we can do as well as sit with each other one-on-one -on -one and just, just listen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And it's so important to start there just to be able to um, be open with each other and be able to sit with each other because you know, like you said, Kelsey, it can be easy to hang out when everybody's doing great, but when they're not in a great place, it can be a lot more difficult to, you know, have yourself be with them in that. Hey, Al, welcome back. Uh oh, are you there? Catch your catch your audio. Yeah. One. So I think, I think too, Marianne, you were talking about asking people how they are and really checking in with people. And this is something that came up in the webinar that IBMA, the, the first part of this series that IBMA did last, uh, I guess it was two weeks ago, is reaching out to people, actually reaching out and connecting, making a phone call making that that active contact and not just doing a hey how are you that's something that we tend to say just in a response saying hello to somebody is ask how are you but do we really really deeply want to know how are you and so sometimes you have to stop and ask a person again when they say oh things are great you know i'm fine i'm getting through whatever you might have to really stop and say no really how are you to get to to get to that meet to really open up that conversation and that vulnerability and the more you do it yourself the more that you open yourself up and um, identify your own situations your own experiences the more others feel comfortable opening themselves up too yeah i think that i think that's very true and sometimes i think the uh having musicians have such wonderful tools because you can you can play music mm -hmm. And uh, how are you? You're fine. Well, maybe we could play. Maybe we could sing. Maybe I could share. Sometimes I think it's not just asking. It's putting something out that we can both respond to. Because how, how I am is I'm angry. You said earlier we're all going through Kubler-Ross's stages of grief. And, and I'm in denial. And sometimes having something external, whether it's a psalm or a, or a song or whatever it is that we can talk about. Really. How's, are you writing? You know, and with Kelsey, it's just got these wonderful activities of daily living. You've got your ADLs all taken care of. You've got two children. If we don't have two children, do we feed the dog? If we don't have the dog, have we have we made a pie for somebody? You know, what do we do on a... In, in our house, it begins with a schedule. We have coffee, and we have the morning schedule, and we now we're in our third legal pad of the schedule and what time and what's going to happen and then later at night we work we we're coming back with cocktail hour but there was too much involved hi welcome back well internet went out here i'm now on hot spot <laughs> very good, very good. <laughs> I, missed, I know i missed a whole lot but anyway you remember what you were saying because it was quite good <laughs> i I don't know where my profundity ended. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it comes back. We were in the you were in an apocryphal stage. Yes. Oh, I think I was probably about done. Just ba basically saying to just to search your heart to find out what's being revealed because that'll give you something to do that's productive. Are musicians that you or artists that you're working with? Um, is there a revelation? Are people being able to see a revelation? Are people being able to reframe the question? Because that was one of the things you were talking about. Yeah, little by little, um, uh, it, it takes some conversation. And sometimes uh, I have a group of uh, folks that I meet with and and we're always trying to reframe it. And it, it helps, it gives them, uh, you know, it gives them something beyond just trying to buck up, you know, like, and, and the other day, I just said, y'all, um, I want to challenge everybody today in the midst of so much bad news to find beauty. 
-hmm. find beauty. And I don't know how you're going to find it. You might find it in um, a poem. You might find it in a story. You might find it in some music. You might find it in a um, on Netflix here and there. Um, but search for beauty and then let's share it with each other. Mm -hmm. And people started writing back and forth. And again, it was just a search for beauty because beauty is out there in the midst of this pain. I, I just saw uh, a lecture by this guy who talked about joy. And he said, you know, joy is never without sorrow because you can be very joyful. And right down the road, there's somebody dying in the hospital with COVID. And he said, so I, I call that a bright sorrow. Uh, joy is a bright sorrow that there's, which I just love that. <laughs> um, but but that, that there is this joy and this sorrow that's always in us. And let's just admit it and start talking about it and have conversations. Mm. Yeah, Al, I think that um, something that is, on the on the point of joy like you were talking about is that joy is joy and happiness can relate but they're very different and that happiness is circumstantial right and joy has to do with the heart um yeah. you can choose joy you can't always choose happiness um mm -hmm. happiness for me is when i don't have to change three diapers within 10 minutes, um, you know, <laughs> stuff like that, yeah. um, you know, and, and joy, um, again, the Bible says weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning, um, which is w where I got the song, Marianne, that you were talking about earlier. Um, so because there was weeping, because there was sorrow, because there were hard days and anxiety and depression, um, there was joy on the other side of that. And so I think that we can choose to be joyful and we can also be sad and angry and scared concurrently. Well, the one theme that I keep repeating is uh, from the Beatitudes, um, when people are not doing well, blessed are those who mourn. Why? Well, they'll be comforted. Mm -hmm. uh, and my assumption is the opposite is true. If you don't mourn, if you don't weep, uh, you won't be comforted. Exactly. Um, and so to me, yeah, be anxious. You'll be comforted. You know, <laughs> be afraid. You'll be comforted. Um, it's just a time to be real. Yes, it's time to be our authentic selves. You were talking earlier about as as we go on in life to find our, our authentic voice. I don't think that was your turn. To find what we really yeah. of ourselves. Yeah. That, that that is our work now and whether it is an ecclesiastical cause that has made that happen or 400 years of history and evolution there's a lot that's happened that's brought us to the point of self-examination mm -hmm. self-examination as christian self-examination as jews self-examination as white people self-examination as people who are black and are struggling with that history and and that trauma. And so looking at ourselves and then looking out, because it's exactly what Kelsey says. She can't look in all day long. Mm -hmm. She got babies that need her. And you know that what a gift, what a gift you're giving us, what a gift they're giving you. What what a blessing to have something that's so vitally important. You can't do one on one anymore. You got to have a zone defense when you got two of them, right? <laughs> so it occupies you just a whole lot. <laughs> Oh yeah, that is so true. <laughs> so many. Oh, that's. Oh my, my gosh, a cat! I love that. <laughs> Listen, I'm so, I'm so glad that just happened because I got distracted for a second because there were three hummingbirds fighting each other like right here <laughs> beside me. <laughs> I need to go outside or something. I mean, <laughs> life. This is authentic life. <laughs> so. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Well, on that note, we're at the end of our, Aww. I just, I have loved every minute of this and you have each brought so many great stories, Marianne, just great information to the table to help all of us. I feel like there are so many 
snippets that we can walk away with of ways that we can help ourselves and help others during this time. And I really appreciate you guys and, and everybody on Facebook Live. There are some wonderful comments. Please go read those. Um, some great suggestions from people who have been watching us. So if there's some bad ones, would you take them off before we oh, oh, totally. because I can't deal with <laughs> insecurity today. Daniel, thank you very much for doing this. And it's yes. to IBMA. Thanks, IBMA, for doing this yeah. and reaching out and, and helping, being there. It's a it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, you guys so much. I appreciate Bye -bye. you having me. Good luck with the children and the cats. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Great to be with everyone. Nice to, nice yeah. to meet you. Very nice to meet you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, y'all. Bye. -bye. You too. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.